Okay, we'll get started. Uh, today, the topic for discussion is Markov decision problems. So the Markov decision problem is a, is a model which is an extension of deterministic decision problems that we have been talking about so far. Uh, the only thing is that there is a noise variable that changes the state at every point of time or at least that affects the state at every point of time. So the state equation would be ft xt ut wt, so this is the uh, noise variable and we have the cost variable j of gamma which is the expected value of sum of t equals 0 to infinity alpha raised to c Uh, let me actually remove the t here. So the f the state transition function and the cost doesn't really depend on time. And this alpha is less than one. is called the discount. Parameter. Okay, so let's think about it. Xt is the temperature of a data center. Ut is the amount of uh, cold air that needs to be put in the data center. Okay, so data centers generate a lot of heat, so their energy requirements is quite a la la quite large. Uh, primarily because, uh, not only because of the computing, but also because of the cooling that needs to be done in order to keep the temperatures inside data centers at a reasonable level. So, so Xt would be the temperature of the data center or temperature at various points within the data center if the data center is pretty large. Uh, Ut is the amount of cold air that needs to be injected at different locations within the data center. So that's the control action. Wt is the noise variable. What do you think would be the noise variable in a data center? What would affect the temperature? Computation. Who said? Yeah, so computation. So how much traffic? So at night, there is going to be little traffic in data centers in the morning or during the day. It's going to be large amount of traffic. Uh, if you're a data center for Netflix or Amazon videos and things like that, then you will have a lot of traffic in the evening from 6 p.m. onwards. So depending upon what kind of data center it is, the traffic during the day is completely random, and that would affect the temperature that the data center is going to have depending upon the actions you are going to take. Okay, so that's one noise variable. What, is, what could be the other noise variable? Yeah. The weather outside, that's true. So uh, if it is very cold temperature, well, Columbus is not that cold right now, but I'm sure in a few months we will get there. So if it is very cold outside, then naturally the data center will be ejecting heat uh, generally through the building and therefore the heating requirement, with, uh, sorry, the cooling requirement will become less. Uh, so definitely weather, outside weather is another noise variable. Uh, what else? Thank you. What's the other noise variable affecting the data center? So I don't know if you know, but a lot of data centers have rooftop solar or would have some sort of agreement with renewable energy producer. So they would want to regulate their heating or cooling depending upon the renewable generation at that particular point of time uh, in order to minimize the energy consumption from carbon-based sources, okay? So some of the newer data centers or specifically Google data centers, they are 
very concerned about green and using green energy for data centers and therefore renewable energy also adds to the randomness uh, for the data center so this noise variable in the case of data centers is so even though the xt is basically temperature around the data center uh, there are quite a few different classes of noise variables that affect the temperatures within data centers so so these kind of problems are usually modeled through a Markov decision problem because the deterministic uh, formulations that we have studied so far is not necessarily useful here. In the case of car, again, xt would be position velocity, ut would be acceleration braking, action noise variables would be the cars around you and what they are doing. Uh, uh, in the case of uh, caching web pages, so nowadays there is this new idea where a base station, the cell phone tower itself, will have some sort of storage. And instead of every time you click BBC News, instead of trying to download the information from BBC News server somewhere in London, it will just cache BBC News stories, or at least the top stories locally, and it will just give you that information. So you don't have to, they don't have to request the information from news servers every time e a user requests those news stories. So again, there is quite a few noise variables as to which among billions of new information that gets created every day, which of them will go viral and what needs to be stored at their local servers and what needs to be accessed from the regular servers from where the data is actually residing. So all the viral news stories or viral videos or viral things, uh, they are typically stored locally at the base station itself so that they don't have to use a lot of data or use a bandwidth to request things that are viral and would be downloaded quite often during the day in that location. So for instance, in the Columbus base station, they would be storing Columbus weather data. Uh, they would be storing news stories regarding Columbus or any upcoming stories that are happening around the city. And also some of the international events that are happening, which is of interest to residents within Columbus. So. So uh, that's where noise variables comes into picture. Now the cost function, of course, depends uh, depending on the application. So in the case of data center, you want to make sure that the temperature is within certain range. So your cost function would be within the range, the cost is zero. Outside the range, the cost is very high. Okay, so you could have a cost function that looks like that. Uh, you could have a cost function that you want to minimize the energy consumption because the temperature boundaries are pretty it's recommended, but it's not really required that if it is between 10 to 20 degrees Celsius, then you don't have to really stick to that 10 to 20. If it reduces your energy bill, that's good, that's good also. So you may have a combination of cost functions or you may have a cost function that purely looks at the energy bill without necessarily looking at the temperature range. So a lot of different cost functions could be, uh, could be constructed for each example and um, and then you want to, of course, minimize by picking an appropriate policy gamma where each gamma t maps xt to ut. Uh, let's not put xt here. Let me put it, which is the information, to action ut. And then remember that we are in a stochastic setting. So these numbers are all random variables. So you want to take the expectation to average out over all possible randomness that could appear in the system according to their probability distribution. Now the other thing that you see here is the discount parameter is something that you haven't seen so far. So why do we need a discount parameter here? So discount is strictly less than one. So what does the discount parameter do? Any thoughts? So, so let's, let's remove the discount parameter. Can someone tell me what could go wrong in this problem? Sorry? It would explode to infinity, right? Because if each of the cost is non-zero, you're summing a non-zero random variable for infinite, uh, which is an infinite sequence, so it could go to infinity. And therefore, in order to understand how to 
you essentially want to rate policies, which policies are good, which policies are bad. So you want the objective function to have finite values. And in order to do that, you just uh, discount it with respect to a specific discount factor raised to uh, the time index t. Okay. Now, uh, you have seen the case of hyperbolic discounting where you have a fixed discount parameter for the entire future. And you realized, at least I'm hoping that everyone has done the assignment. So uh, you know that it leads to time inconsistent policies where you need to redo optimization every, time, every point of time. But if you have a discount parameter, which at every point of time you have alpha raised to t, uh, this doesn't lead to time inconsistent policy. So you, you get a strongly time, strongly time consistent policy, optimal policy, if an optimal policy exists here. Okay, so that's just a minor remark why we should have exponential discounting, which is a function of time. Any questions so far? That's just the formulation. Okay. Now I want to come back to this problem where your gamma t is now a function of information not just the current state. And you could have multiple information. Uh, so you could have it equals to x0, u0, x1, u1, all the way up to xt. You could have it as x0, x1, xt. You could have it, which is just xt. So you could have different information that you have stored to make your decision. Okay? And you could have any other information sets that may be your favorite. So in the case of data center example, you have stored the temperature history. So you, you built a data center today and you have stored the entire temperature sequence that you have, uh, that you have gathered until now uh, from that data center. So you could store all the information. You could store some part of the information that was generated. You would store only the current information and discard everything that you have seen in the past. Okay? So you can have varying level of information for your Markov decision problem. Now my question is, what information is really crucial for making a decision and what can we throw away? Is there a benefit for having more information in an MDP setting? Why? Well, reduce the speed. It reduce the? The speed of the oil of the calculator. Yes, okay, so yeah, so if you have more information, then it is going to cost you a lot more to compute the optimal strategy, okay? So yes, that is true. More information leads to higher complexity. But let's say I give you a supercomputer, so you now have no computational constraints. You can store the data, you can calculate things very fast, not a problem, it can handle very large amount of data. Is there still any, any benefit, any mathematical benefit of storing all the information that you have seen so far? Everything that you have seen so far. So if it's a very fast dynamic system, then you don't need to store the initial information. Uh, okay. Let's, let's, try, let's try to go back. So this is a room. This room was perhaps constructed maybe 30 years ago. Uh, over the last 30 years, it has gone through several temperatures, up and down fluctuations, and it has seen a lot of people in the room. It has seen very few people in the room. In order to control the temperature today, or at this point of time, do we need to know what, how many people were inside, what was the temperature 30 years ago, 29 years ago, 28 years ago, and so on? Is it really needed? What do you think? No, no, okay. So it appears that having the entire history doesn't seem to affect 
our decision making today. Okay, and this is a one, one of the most fundamental theorems of Markov decision problems that among all possible history dependent strategies. So these are all history dependent. Uh, uh, so this, this is all the different types of history dependence. And so among all history dependent strategies, there exists a Markov policy that is optimal. So Markov policy is defined as or Markov strategy. Let, let's just use strategy. Although policy and strategies are used interchangeably, So Markov strategy means gamma t is a function of xt and it maps to ut. Oh, and gamma doesn't depend on t. So gamma is actually stationary. I should add stationary here. And this is a mathematical result. And the way it is proved is as follows. I'm not going to give you the complete proof because it's a very general result, but the proof idea Oh, let's, 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 let me ask you guys, you've taken like the entire course in optimization now. How would you go about proving a result like this? What would be the underlying idea for a proof of this result? Any thoughts? Yeah. Start with like all the history and then remove one portion and then just keep like one uh, Yeah, you are, uh, yeah, I think that's basically how, uh, that's the overlying, yeah, that, that's the underlying idea here. So the idea, the main idea is that pick a history dependent dependent uh, non-stationary strategy strategy gamma and then construct a stationary Markov strategy mu from x to u such that j of gamma is greater than or equal to j of mu. Okay, so this is the way uh, the proof is done in a very, very general setting. So uh, you can pick up any sophisticated book on MDPs and you will find the proof there, perhaps in the first two chapters. 
the standard text is for this kind of uh, result is Bertrickus and Shreve. 1978. I don't know if it is 78 or 76 or 77, but this is a standard text for uh, a result like this. So what does this uh, result mean operationally for all of us? It means that if you have a stochastic system with a lot of randomness and you have a cost that doesn't change with time and you have a transition function that doesn't change with time, uh, so basically once the room is made, it's, it's not like on an everyday basis there is some construction going on in the room. and things are changing. So once the room is made, it remains like that for very, very long periods of time. So that's the stationarity assumption here. Then there is no point keeping track of all the states that you have seen. You just have to store the current state. You just have to look at the current temperature. You just have to look at the current position and speed of your vehicle. It doesn't matter what you did in the past. Now this reduces the memory requirement, but it also reduces another thing. So it reduces the memory requirement for storing the relevant information for doing the optimization but it also reduces the size of the strategy space over which you have to look for optimal policies. Okay? And that's also another very important uh, outcome of this result. Okay? So it reduces the memory requirement and it also reduces the computational complexity because the number of functions that map xt to ut is very, very small in comparison to number of functions gamma that maps the entire history to ut, okay? Any questions so far? Okay. So now we want to identify the optimal stationary Markov strategy uh, gamma star or mu star for this problem. So how would we do that? <coughs> Any thoughts? Let's apply dynamic program, right? Dynamic program is the only uh, possibility to get a get a strategy that depends on the state, okay? If it was open loop, then of course it's not dependent on the state, but we want something that is dependent on the current state, so we have to apply dynamic program. So we start with V, oh, so in the terminal cost, we started with Vt plus 1 equal to 0, but in this case, there is no terminal cost, so what would, what would we do? We we'll let just define it at V0 equals to 0. Then V1, so this is not the time index, you know, so this is, uh, This is not the time index. I want to, how do I emphasize that this is not a time index? So, okay, so what's the important thing here? So in a terminal cost problem, we started with Vt of xt equals Ct of xt, right? That's what we started with. 
But in this case, this t is equal to infinity, and this ct is equal to zero, okay? But I can't have an induction step that starts with infinity, right? Because I'm going from infinity to infinity minus one to infinity minus two to infinity minus three, and so on. So this is like, uh, so therefore, that's why I'm emphasizing that this is not the time index, this is just the induction step because I can't have infinity there. Can't have infinity as an index. So anyways, V0 is equal to zero because I don't have any terminal cost. Now V1 is equal to V1 of x min u in u, C of x comma u plus alpha V0, no. Okay, so I take the expectation of V0 evaluated at F, so this is the next state, uh, so F of X U comma W, that's the next state, so V0 at the next state, multiplied by a discount factor of alpha. This alpha is the same alpha that you see here as the discount factor. Okay, so that gives me V1, then I pick V2, which is min of C X U plus alpha expected value of V1. And go, and so on. So this is expected value of V1 that you have found here, evaluated at the next time step, and then an expectation, and then multiplication by alpha, and add it to the current cost. Of course, you have to compute this for every possible state x. And you have to continue this process, and the final result So what will happen if we continue this iteration? What we have is Vk converges to V infinity as k goes to infinity. So you have convergence, okay? And in fact, this convergence is an infinity norm. V infinity goes to zero as k goes to infinity. So that's the first norm, first result. Second result is V infinity equals to, well, gamma star x. Gamma star is optimal. Optimal. 
Marco stationary strategy. And then the third result is J gamma star equals to V infinity. Yes? Uh, what are the subscripts for f of x, u, and w here? So you do it for all possible x. So there is no subscript here. So you do it for all possible x. You have to take the minimum over all possible u. And you average over all possible w's. Uh, so remember, in dynamic program, you do it for all possible states and for all possible time. So, so there is no starting point at the current state. Okay, so it's true for all. You do it for all possible states. Yeah. Okay, so all of this computation has to be done offline, and. Uh, in most situations, you would, what you would have is a simulator or you would have some sort of data from the uh, input output data from the individual system. So for instance, if you are a data center, you would have the input output data, the temperature data versus how much cooling uh, you have injected. So you would have that data for a long period of time. And then you use that data to build a model and you use that model to compute what the optimal policy is going to look like, depending upon your energy cost as well as your temperature uh, range that you want to keep the. So uh, here x and u basically means that x at that time is dead. Uh, no. Uh, at the beginning. No. This x is just, OK, so let's think about it. So at temp let's say I want my temperature to be around 15. Well, your temperature could go anywhere between 0 to 30 degrees Celsius. And let's say you discretize it at 1 degree Celsius. So you would have x for all 0 degree, so 0 degree Celsius, 1 degree Celsius, 2 degree Celsius, and so on. For every amount of cooling that you're injecting, cool air that you're injecting into the system, what's the cost of energy plus What's the future value, the future cost of energy that you're going to incur? So you're basically searching on the whole grid. Yes, you're searching on the whole grid. OK. That's right. You're searching on the whole state space and the whole action space for the optimal policy. Yes, but I want you to tell me what the intuition is. So okay, so you have an alpha less than one. What does it, what does it uh, point towards? So let me write it. Okay, let me make the problem simple. I'm going to write vk plus one equals to t of vk. Okay, so this is a nonlinear operator. Uh, I'm going to use T to denote this nonlinear operator. What does this point towards? T is a contraction mapping. So you can show that TV minus TV prime absolute value is less than, e no, this is infinity norm of TV minus TV prime is less than equal to alpha V minus V prime. This alpha is the same alpha as the contraction, the, as the discount parameter. So by contraction mapping theorem, vk minus v infinity would converge to zero as k goes to infinity. The proof of this result is similar to the min-max result that you have. 
Remember you had a min-max result in your assignment. So the proof is very similar to the min-max result here. <coughs> okay. So because of the contraction mapping, we have this result, we have this result. This requires a little bit of effort to show that this is the optimal stationary strategy. What you essentially want to show is that J of gamma star is less than or equal to J of gamma for all gamma. So it requires a little bit of effort and this comes out as a natural consequence of this particular result. The number third. Of course, in reality, you don't go all the way to infinity, so you kind of stop after you stop seeing improvement. So you basically go from, you look at the infinity norm of Vk and Vk plus 1, and if it is, if the value is not improving a lot, like if this is less than epsilon, epsilon is some tolerance parameter, then you stop the iteration and then you compute the optimal policy or approximately optimal policy and publish that as your solution. Okay. This algorithm is known as value iteration iteration algorithm for MDP. Okay. Okay, so let's start from the beginning. We have a dynamic system which is driven by some sort of noise variable. We have a cost that we want to minimize, but we will discount the future cost. So current is more important, 10 time steps future is not that important, 100 time steps in the future is very minuscule. It has very minuscule importance. Okay, so that is modeled through this discount parameter. Uh, we want to compute a policy gamma that maps the available information to action um, and minimize this overall cost function. The first result we learned is that you actually don't need to log all the information. You just need to know what the current state is and typically the current state can be measured through a sensor. So in fact, you don't even need a, a storage device. Okay, so for it, in the case of this particular room, uh, there is a temperature sensor somewhere. Uh, oh, there it is. So there is a temperature sensor. It senses the current temperature, sends the information to the air conditioning system. The air conditioning system starts injecting cold air versus slash hot air to raise the temperature to an appropriate or reduce the temperature to an appropriate level. Okay, so that's the benefit of restricting yourself to Markov strategy. You don't need any storage device to store the data. Then we realize that, okay, we need an algorithm to compute the optimal policy. Now that we know that an optimal policy is of Markov, uh, satisfies the Markov stationarity property. So we realize that, okay, there is no terminal cost here. So in fact, the terminal cost Vt has to be equal to zero and T is equal to, capital T is equal to infinity. So we just start from infinity and come all the way to zero. But we can't write infinity, infinity minus one, infinity minus two, so we start from V0, then write V1, V2, and overall Vk plus one equals to Tvk, where T is a nonlinear operator involving min C plus alpha, the function V, which we are iterating over, and then the state transition function and the expectation. It's a highly nonlinear operator. Um, it involves an expectation, which is a linear operation over V, but uh, it also involves a minimization, and therefore it's a problem. But nonetheless, this nonlinear operator satisfies the contraction condition used under the infinity norm. So this contraction is not under any of the other norms, but only infinity norm. 
So it's a contraction under infinity norm, which means that VK would converge to V infinity as K goes to infinity. And we have a value iteration algorithm which allows us to compute the optimal Markov strategy. Now this is another area where the proof of convergence of an algorithm comes from contraction mapping theorem, okay? We are, in my own research, I'm exploring some of these connections um, and trying to understand properties of contraction mapping theorem with some amount of randomness. And it's leading to a very beautiful set of results that I cannot talk about right now. Uh, but uh, that's something we are, we are working on at this moment. It's a really beautiful topic to work on. Now, this is the past, okay? So this is something that was already done or known by 1960s. So what's the present, okay? The present is as follows. I have a system, a complicated system. I don't have the transition function. So why do I not have the transition function? Well, I do not, I do not know how to model it. It's very complicated. So let's consider the following scenario. All of you know we are all worried about renewable energy and how the earth is going to look in 2100. Uh, so people are putting up wind farms. What's the problem in wind farms? So you have the first set of, so let's say wind is blowing in this direction, you have the first set of wind farms, not the wind farms, wind turbines. Then you have the second set of wind turbines that are slightly behind the first set of wind turbines. And then you have the third set of wind turbines and fourth set and so on. Every time the wind blows over the wind turbine, it affects the flow of air, okay? So there are different sets of turbulence that get set up in the air and that affects the production downstream. So the first set of wind turbines produces maximum amount of electricity, the second set of wind turbines it has lower amount of electricity production and so on and so forth. Now, if you sit down from the first principle, starts from Navier-Stokes solution and how it interacts with wind farms and the resulting PDEs, it's very complicated, okay? Um, so being able to model the overall production of wind farms, uh, so, sorry, uh, depending upon the velocity of the air, how much energy we are going to produce is a very complicated problem for which the state transition function is very difficult to know. So what are, so let's consider what the state is. The state is how much electricity I'm producing from each wind turbine. WT is what the velocity of the air is. So at the first instance, at the second wind set of wind farms, the third set of wind farms and so on. What is UT? What can we control in a wind turbine? The direction, of the direction of the? You can't really change the direction. For that, you'll have to rotate the whole wind turbine. So what else can you change? You're pretty close, but not there yet. The blade angle. The blade angle, okay? So you can, so there are variable pitch wind turbines, so you can change the blade angle. And what would you like to have? What would your eventual output be? What do you want to have from a wind turbine? Sorry? Yeah, but, but what should your goal be? Maximize the generation? Subject to the storage constraints. Subject to? The storage constraints. A storage constraint, okay. So you want to maximize the power, con power production subject to storage constraint, okay. So that's a good goal. What other goal would you like to have? So the wind varies over from moment to moment, seconds to seconds, hours to hour. What would you like to have? Consistent power. Consistent power supply. So if the velocity is changing every second, you don't want the power to be, the production to be changing every second. So you want to have some sort of consistency. So really you can have a varied amount of cost function depending upon what kind of wind farm you have. 
uh, you don't have the dynamics uh, because you don't want to model from the first, from the basic principles of physics, you don't want to model the interactions between one wind turbine and other wind turbine. Um, but you can collect a lot of data. Okay, data is free. You just have a data logger. You can collect the data from a lot of places. You can collect weather data and so on. So the idea is you want to use this data. You want to be able to collect this data and you want to be able to use it to compute an approximately optimal strategy, gamma star. But this requires, this technique requires an explicit knowledge of F, an explicit knowledge of the distribution W, so that you can compute the expectation, and an explicit knowledge of the cost function C. And when you have these complex interactions you don't know F. You may not know what the distribution W is, but perhaps you can do some sort of regression to compute the distribution. And you may or may not know the cost function. Okay, so in many systems, cost function is something you concoct. So yes, you, can, you may have information about the cost function, but in some cases, you may not. So the modern techniques uh, is built upon this idea that I can have a lot of data from specific systems, which I do not understand very well because modeling it is very difficult. So why don't we use the data to compute the optimal strategy? And this whole set of techniques is known as reinforcement learning. And this is what the course EC8851 is going to be about. We will see how to use the data to avoid computing this expectation avoid having the knowledge of F, and use the input-output data and some uh, knowledge of the cost to compute the approximately optimal strategy, gamma star. And reinforcement learning is a very closely related topic to artificial intelligence where people talk about uh, learning things on the go and, uh, and then a system learning how to behave just by using data. So the underlying optimization formulation is that of MDP. And on top of that sits some sort of iterative algorithms that uses or exploits this underlying concept of value iteration. Uh, it uses a combination of these two techniques to actually come up with a system that learns on its own what the optimal strategy or optimal solution should be. And we are going to review some of these techniques in EC8851 next semester. I know many of you are uh, registered for that. So I guess I'll see you guys in the next semester. OK, so we are coming to an end. Any question on MDPs? No? So. MDPs, this formulation, even though it looks pretty simple, it's sufficiently general to model also a lot of machine learning algorithms. So for instance, people have viewed generative adversarial network, a topic that has received quite a bit of attention in the machine learning community, as a Markov decision problem, where you have an adversary and a machine learning system, and they are trying to interact with each other. So without going further into that, uh, I guess I'm going to stop here. In the next class, I'm going to talk about game theory, where instead of having one decision maker optimizing one objective function, you have multiple decision makers optimizing multiple objective functions. So the extreme case is adversarial interactions where one person's cost is other person's reward. So for instance, chess, where if, if I win, then you lose. Okay, So it's a zero-sum game. It's an adversarial game. Uh, if I'm a... Hacker, I want to hack into your system, steal all your data. That's an adversarial system where my reward is directly related to your loss. Um, and then there are non-zero sum games where the two things don't add up to zero. Okay? So we'll talk about some of these uh, topics in the next class. So thank you for your attention.